and gentlemen, a very good morning and a very warm welcome on behalf of SAPI, the Think Factory. This is Angita Goel in here to navigate you through today's webinar on AI as a force multiplier in defense. Well, AI or artificial intelligence, which till few years back used to be a thing of dystopian science fictions or fantasy movies, it has come to be a critical part of our lives. With each passing year, this super transformative and revolutionary technology is growing in its adoption, evolution, and capabilities, promising to help us in countless ways in almost all realms of our lives. So be it to boost innovation, to fight discrimination, or manage the health of our planet. We all saw the unbelievable pace at which COVID vaccines were developed last year, thanks to AI. AI is now around everywhere. Often we do not even notice it. In our day-to-day -day lives, Siri and Alexa can make us laugh by cracking a joke. Our digital twins or doppelgangers can spookily swap us and sit for us in a Zoom webinar like today's. According to a renowned futurist, Ray Kurzweil, computers will have the same level of intelligence as humans by 2029 very close. Perhaps I'll not be there for exaggerating if I say we are at the inflection point of this planet's history caused by AI-led technological revolution, which no country, no society, no business, no entity, no human can afford to ignore. You ignore and bet me you lag behind. No wonder everybody today seems to be interested in AI. However, the problem is that there are a lot of misconceptions and myths and obesity surrounding the domain. On the one hand of this spectrum are the cynics who call AI a job snatcher or a monster or a terminator in making. There are others who call it next to God. However, in between there are multitudes of people and organizations like us who want clarity, direction, and expert advice when it comes to application of AI in their world life or work life. It is with this in backdrop that SAPI has come up with a series of webinars on demystifying AI. Well, as you know that SAPI aims to bring together academia, industry, and active citizens to produce actionable knowledge. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is with the same intent that we have worked it today a luminary of domain experts with huge hands-on experience on the subject. Please join me in welcoming our chief guest, Padmashri Professor Bimal Roy, Chairman National Statistical Commission and a renowned encryption expert. Joining him is Colonel Samrendra Mohan Kumar, again, a renowned AI expert and co-founder and MD of Midcat Advisory Services for his keynote address. I also welcome other esteemed speakers, including two CEOs of successful AI startups, Mr. Alok Tiwari and Mr. Ne Saran Nerkar. Last not least, we acknowledge very graceful presence of all other dignitaries and very special audience comprising of bureaucrats, researchers, professors, um, bureaucrats, and friends from forces. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Pradeep Gupta, the founder of SEPI, Please permit me to a, give a little background to him. Mr. Gupta, he's the founder of SAPI, an ardent AI lover. He's a former bureaucrat who has worked in many capacities with many dignitaries. He brings with him huge experience in defense production and border management. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me now to move on to our next presenter, Mr. Alok Tiwari. He'll be presenting on AI in border surveillance. A bit about Mr. Tiwari. Mr. Tiwari is CEO of AIWAT, a startup in predictive analysis, computer vision, and NLP. With him, he brings 20 years of experience of being a passionate technologist and a doer. And yet he loves to call himself a learner. He has filed a couple of patents besides delving in several AI-based other projects, national level and international level. 
Mr. Tiwari, over to you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your kind words. And uh, I'll be happy to share some of our thought uh, for food, basically, for today's session on the border surveillance, how the AI can be applied to the border surveillance. Uh, just a minute, let me share my screen. Uh, I hope my screen is visible to everyone. Yes, yes. Thank you. So, well, uh, I will just go through with the quick introduction about the, you know, how the AI will be applicable for the border surveillance and the current scenario. And then uh, two of the major applications we'll talk about on the border surveillance. Uh, one is uh, uh, tunnel detection and underground landmines, uh, followed by the border infiltration for land, sea, and air. So we'll be limiting on uh, to only on these topics today, uh, and we'll be happy to you know take any other topic offline if anybody is interested. So if you look into uh, with the current trend of the you know accuracy and precision of today's weapons, which is like you know uh, going, and we have seen in the current Ukraine and Russia war as well with the precisions and all, that is definitely you know forcing contemporary battlefields to empty of human content. So basically, where we want like you know to be more on the technological bar instead of like human to human, what happens uh, traditionally. And now we can see like you know more and more sensors uh, being you know introduced into the battle space, which is you know collecting uh, enormous amount of data, and how you evaluate and you can do the best use of data that's where the artificial intelligence comes into the picture and with a, a right kind of the algorithm and data model uh if we can put it for the training that can be uh be very much beneficial for the armed forces so uh, i'll just go through the you know the first of the applications that when we talk about the you know underground landmines and tunnel detections with the current uh we can look into the use of the some of the specific sensors uh, when we talk about uh, uh, metal detectors and radar and lidar that can definitely help in identifying the landmines uh, with their you know sensors data feedback and with the use of ai we will be able to you know uh, create a landmine map which can help in identifying the safe path for the uh, any missions and uh, on the sensitive area for uh, defense professionals. Definitely, these are mostly the conceptual <laughs> with, uh, uh, sense of data uh, model training on the concept basis. Uh, actual application uh, can be only be tested and uh, implemented with the collaboration of the defense forces or BSF because these are the sensitive data and that lies with them. And it can be possible only with the industry and uh, uh, defense forces collaboration. Uh, which is on the actual field, it has to be tested. Second part here, we talk about the tunnel detection, where the, we look into the LIDAR and uh, the seismic sensors data uh, plays a big role. The sens seismic sensors help us in you know, looking and digging out what is there uh, below the ground surface level. And for that, I will uh, share uh, two of the screen. So, where we can see the capabilities of the AI. So if you look into on the screen, this is the data of the seismic sensors which shows some of them are rock and some of them are salt that is used for the oil drilling basically to exploring the oil and oil drilling. Since the oil drill does not work on the salt, but it uh, does work on the rock, uh, they have to scan out. And the seismic sensors data when we're looking to, you know, with the naked eyes, it will be hard, very hard to differentiate which is rock and which is salt. But by using the AI model, uh, I'll show you the screen here. So if you see here, we are able to differentiate clearly the white is salt and black is rock. So that's where the AI uh, plays the big role. In the similar methodology, we can use the same concept to identify uh, on the border security purpose uh, below the surface level with the using the similar uh, sensors data. Definitely, again, the, it's the concept only and that can work and can be implemented only with the collaboration with the defense since it's a, a secured and confidential data uh, with the defense forces and uh, we need to collaborate uh, to work on the actual application. 
The next application is border infiltration for the land, sea, and air. Here we can use the similar kind of the sensors that we can put it across uh, on the drones and we can have based on the capabilities of the sensors as well as the high uh, uh, SD cameras that we can uh, put in on the uh, drones and they can fly on the certain heights like one and two kilometer and that can help us even like you know getting into the uh, looking at the pixel level details and we can identify even a single dot on the uh, coastal line or on the border infiltration uh, for the I mean border monitoring for the uh, uh, land as well. So those applications that definitely with the help of the computer vision and the data we get from the sensors that can help in you know uh, having an automated control, uh, no, automated monitoring systems uh, for the uh, border securities, and that can flag out I mean a single minor uh, difference. What happens like we can define what are the normal activities into the certain environment when we talk about the sea or the land and we can define what are the abnormal activities. So the AI model, it trains with the live data and the historical data uh, training on the uh, normal activities and it will automatically trigger and flag out wherever we see if there's any abnormal activity. So that does not require a person to continuously putting on uh, the eyes on the monitor and it can flag out easily. And even if some of the, you know, with the human error, if somebody missed out, the AI can precisely uh, pick up those abnormal activities or anything that comes into the, their sensor range or the uh, video range easily uh, with the flag that can highlight immediately. So those are the things that is, I'm just talking on the very high level uh, that can help in the border security uh, as well as the, you know, uh, landmine uh, detections. Uh, uh, India is having like basically hybrid borders, like which has the coastal line, has the you know land, sea. So we definitely need to invent the AI in that, and we'll be happy to take it offline if any detail uh, discussions required on that. And I will say thanks here uh, due to the time constraint and. Uh, you guys can take the uh, contact details of myself and Neeraj uh, if there's any detail and discussion required on that. Uh, apart from that, the, all the questions related to uh, these applications will be welcomed uh, after our you know, keynote speaker and the chief guest presentation. Uh, we'll be happy to take it on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Alok Tiwari. That was very ins interesting and insightful presentation indeed. You emphasized on right kind of algorithm. Yes, we humans are bundles of emotions and biases and prejudices. And chances are that whatever is playing with our minds may pass on to our data. Well, we have to be very cautious. So there were some very useful takeaways for those dealing with the researches and practices and decision-making in defense production. Thank you once again. Over to Mr. Sarang now for his presentation on collaborative coalition-based deployment model. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sarang is young CEO of InnoSapien Technology. It's a startup in wearable computing and augmented reality. He had been a scientist for long in Toronto University and has many research papers published in international journals, which were blind peer reviewed journals he has amazingly 10 patents to his credit. He had been closely associated with Professor Steve Mann of Toronto University, who is known as father of wearable computing. Ladies and gentlemen, over to Mr. Nerkar. Thank you very much for the introduction, ma'am. And it is great to be at this platform here today. I would also like to thank Pradeep sir for bringing out certain important topics such as the importance of new age technologies in the defense space, along with the importance of domain experts. I would also like to thank uh, my colleague Alok Tiwari for giving a brief presentation on certain possibilities of applications of artificial intelligence in the defense space. I, as ma'am mentioned, am the founder of InnoSapien Defense Technologies, a startup that works on wearable computing, augmented reality, and artificial intelligence-based solutions for the defense sector. 
what you can see on the screen is a render of the product that we have developed. In the previous presentation, Alok mentioned about certain concepts that can be used for applications in different space. What we have done is we've gone a little beyond the concept stage and created an actual minimum viable product, an MVP. And today I'll be talking about the model that we had to go through for development of this particular prototype and MVP. And that model we are calling the collaborative coalition based development model. As sir mentioned, the importance of new age emerging technologies is increasing. The applications of these technologies can help us leapfrog in the overall defense space and help us become a leader. But often when you try to introduce these new technologies to the defense setup, you have to start from scratch because augmented reality is a complex term. Quantum computing is a complex term. So for the entire ecosystem, it is important for the innovator or startup or entrepreneur to explain this technology. And that's why this four pillar got, uh, golden quadrilateral approach is what we've used, where the end user, the academia, the industry, and the government creates a conducive environment for innovation to take place. The first pillar of this model is the end user. Often what happens is we try to create technologies and then retrofit it for the applications of end users. But that very seldom leads to acceptance of the technologies. For effective acceptance of the technology, again, I'm speaking from our personal experience, we try to work with the end user first. And in that case, we applied a customization feedback and acceptance feedback loop, where we had several meetings with the armed forces unit, where we initially showed them the different functionalities that we had developed in the research phases, which is at the University of Toronto. After showing a set of eight functionalities, the armed forces unit selected three functionalities that were of importance to them. Basis that, they provided us a problem statement and a problem statement that was relevant to their needs. Beyond that, we had a series of eight plus meetings where we customized our product basis the feedback that we received from the armed forces unit until there was acceptance. With every meeting, and every round of customization, we were getting closer to acceptance from the end user. Basis that, the end users actually assess the proposed solution and the uh, proof of concept and provided feedback, which led to the final creation of final solution, which is the minimum viable product. The minimum viable product was then tested on field conditions, again, that were provided by the end user. Alok in his previous presentation also mentioned about various important aspects that only the end users have because of confidentiality reasons and also because of security reasons. And that's why the end user is a very, very important pillar of this golden quadrilat. Beyond field condition testing, the product was finally recommended for procurement. And that is the stage that is extremely important. And that is what we believe leads to positive feedback towards procurement. The next important leg of this golden quadrilateral is the academia. Once a minimum viable product is created, innovators or startups or entrepreneurs need access to testing facilities. These testing facilities are often difficult to get access to or are rather expensive. And that is where academia can help because partnering with the academia can give you access to these testing facilities. Along with that, academia also plays a major role in filling technology or knowledge gap. So for instance, from the eight functionalities, moving to the three functionalities and trying to meet the problem statement provided to us, there were certain technology gaps. And in that, various universities, such as my alma mater, University of Toronto, assisted. There are also certain knowledge gaps, which various other universities can provide. In our case, the Oxford University, where I'm a course tutor, has helped in that. After that, there is the process of standardization. We all know that for any product to be accepted in the armed forces, it has to meet certain military standards. And understanding those military standards and meeting them is again a complex task where academia plays a major role. Beyond that, technical recommendation is something that is not particularly necessary in every case, but can be very helpful if received from academia. And this can be similar to the approach that is taken in agriculture, where any new pesticide or fertilizer or any new product is first tested by agriculture universities, government 
agriculture universities and beyond testing they provide a recommendation and that recommendation is officially accepted by the government and then further propagated beyond this there is the industry which plays a major major role again in terms of testing facilities a lot of industry especially large industry houses have their in house testing facilities which can provide support to innovators and startups more important than that is the financial capital doing all of this work requires money and as we all know in the defense space everything starts with ncnc demos and that's why that initial financial gap is something that the industry can assist in other than that there is also the fact that all of these new technologies play a small role in a larger picture which is subsystems in larger systems and having access to that larger systems is important again something that can be provided by industry and that has worked in our case along with that integration of the innovation in the larger system so that it actually leads to positive uh, uh, procurement beyond that there is also domain specific knowledge and manufacturing support and knowledge because after mvp you actually have to produce these things with the mill standards and over there industry can provide knowledge as well as manufacturing support which can also provide access to the testing facilities and financial capital but more importantly it can provide access to procurement procedures the defense procurement procedure is a complex document and understanding the entire process can be difficult and the simplification of the understanding of the procurement procedure is where the government plays a major role what i was mentioning is that the four pillars of this golden quadrilateral are extremely difficult for innovators to actually reach out to and that is the role that sapi is trying to play over here by bringing all of these stakeholders on the same platform like this webinar here today where innovators can come and interact with various stakeholders and get access to them and have a space where innovation can be done so that is it from my end we can continue with the rest of the program thank you thank you mr sarang again lovely insights and the model you suggested it was really based on your own learnings nobody can deny that there is urgent need to create a very conducive ecosystem in india for the same so that we can have fast paced development in these fields well you also emphasized on making education knowledgeable uh, making client educated and knowledgeable and making them realize what is their actual need 